All right, thanks for coming out. Uh, great day here in Columbia. First of all, I know it's a big weekend here uh, for South Carolina athletics, so I want to wish luck and uh, encourage all of the Gamecock fans to get out and support our equestrian team this weekend who has a match, and men's tennis, um, men's basketball tomorrow, beach volleyball all weekend, uh, women's basketball, men's basketball all at home this weekend. And I, we obviously know about the importance of the baseball series that's starting tonight as well. And uh, best of luck to Coach Kingston and his squad. Looking forward to getting over there tonight. Let's get this weather out of here, but looking forward to getting over there tonight for, the, uh, for that game also. So best of luck to them and uh, love what we're doing here at Carolina from an athletic standpoint and the great teams we have on campus right now. From a football standpoint, uh, spring break is next week here at this university. So excited for our guys to be able to get away and relax a little bit next week for those of them that are traveling. We just finished up uh, late last night, kind of our last uh, winter workout, if you will, uh, before spring break, but really pleased with the pro progress our guys have made in the months of January and February in the weight room, like this group, like the leadership on this team and the way they're going about their business. We've, we've gotten better, we've gotten stronger, we've gotten faster, we've gotten more athletic with the freshmen that we've brought in, the transfers that we brought in, but then the entire team with what they've done in the weight room with Coach Day and his staff, uh, going back to when we started workouts uh, in January. They've done a great job and credit to Luke Day and his staff and then credit to our players with the way that they've uh, worked also. So like where we are and then getting ready to jump into spring practice here in a couple weeks as well. I know we'll talk more about that as we get going with that. Uh, didn't think we'd be here again introducing a wide receivers coach, but uh, it is what it is. The previous receivers coach made a decision that he felt was best for his family. Uh, we collected the $450,000, then some, that we were owed uh, for vo uh, violating or leaving his contract. And then it allowed us to go out and hire an even better wide receivers coach in my mind. And, and that's not a knock on anybody, but that's what I feel about this guy right here that, that uh, the first time around didn't talk to him just because I knew kind of what I wanted to do with the position with some of the staff shuffling that I did after the season. And um, uh, that's what I did previously. But now that we had an actual search for a wide receivers coach, um, that was a, it was a great opportunity to bring someone in to make us better. And again, some of my, uh, the things that I want, and I think I may have mentioned this in the previous press conference, but just looking at our wide receiver group as a whole, want, wanted to get someone in here that can develop our guys a little bit better than what we have. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at who we were playing receiver with last season, it's guys that we inherited, um, that uh, that were here when I got here as the head coach for the most part, uh, or transfers that we had brought in, had been a little disappointed. And again, it starts with me as the head coach, had been a little disappointed with the freshmen that we've brought into a program that we recruited and their development. You know, obviously Nick Harbor played a lot for us last season, but beyond Nick, there really hasn't been one in the last three seasons. And uh, that can't continue. We've got to be able to recruit our guys and then develop them when they get here. And uh, confident that Mike Furry will do that for us. And then we've got to be more consistent as a receiver group. Uh, too many drops last season in critical situations. And again, that starts with me as the head coach. And it's, but we just need to be more consistent and, um, and be a little bit better there from a development standpoint and recruiting standpoint. That's what I was looking for. And I feel like we've hit a home run with who we've brought in uh, with him. Um, someone, he's got an unbelievable story. If you go back to his career from college walk-on to NFL starter, and not just an NFL starter on the offensive side of the ball, but an NFL starter on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and then ends up going to Detroit and leads the NFC in receptions as a wide receiver also in his NFL career. Got done playing. A lot of guys, when they get done with their playing career, they just want to go coach at the highest level. Easy for a guy to say, I've been a very accomplished NFL uh, pro professional football tenure vet. I need to be hired at the top of the top in college football. And he left and took a job as the head coach at Kentucky Christian 
Uh, and no disrespect to Kentucky Christian, but it's a little bit of an unorthodox move. But went there, made that program better. Went to Marshall, coached wide receivers. Went to Limestone as a head coach. Went to the Chicago Bears as a receivers coach. Came back to Limestone as a head coach. And everywhere that he's been, he's made that place better. And he's made those wide receivers better. And confident that he'll do that here for us um, as well, as I always do in, in situations like this. Talk to a lot of people, whether it be people that he coached with, uh, in the NFL, people he coached with in college, players that he coached in the NFL, players that he coached against in the NFL that were on teams that he coached receivers with Chicago but played defensive back um, that I had relationships with. And, and everything was, was super positive. Um, excited about Mike Furry and his family being here and, and jumping into the community here in Columbia as well. He, uh, was, uh, that hire was approved by our board yesterday morning and he had a meeting with his team yesterday and he was here in the building and already at work with our players on the field within five minutes of being in Columbia. Um, showed up here, we didn't, we didn't even let the guy change clothes. He walked in the building, immediately went to a special teams meeting and then we walked out on the field and um, we just had a little workout going on with our players and he and I were standing on the sidelines talking, just kind of pointing out who different guys are. I walked over to the defensive field, told him to just kind of make himself at home and, and get acclimated and walked back about 10 minutes later and he's already out there in, in street clothes out on the field working with our receivers. So I feel confident in saying that he's been here less, he's been here 24 hours and he's made our group better already. Uh, Going to be a great recruiter for us, great addition to our program and couldn't be more excited about Mike Furry being our new wide receivers coach and his family being here also. So before we bring Mike up, any questions about anything? David? Just want kind of a big picture, Shane. The story just popped that uh, apparently today leaders are expected to recommend finalizing helmet uh, communications between coach and players on the sideline. How do you feel about that? It probably won't be here for next year, but down the road, how do you like that idea? I think it will be here for this year. Um, I think it's going to be immediate. That's just me talking. I haven't read the article, but um, I think it's certainly trending in that direction. I'm mixed. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that people think this will eliminate sign stealing, signal stealing. I don't think that's going to happen. I think um, um, it's not as slam dunk. Okay, that's what's, what, what's going to happen. Uh, I think it's good in a lot of ways. It was something, David, we had a SEC head coaches meeting in Birmingham two weeks ago, and we spent a lot of time talking about as head coaches. And, and certainly there were some mixed opinions in that room, some that were in favor of it, some that weren't in favor of it. Offensive coaches that were, offensive coaches that weren't, defensive coaches that were, defensive coaches that weren't. So a lot of viewpoints and a lot of opinions, and, and uh, we made the decision to be unified coming out of that meeting as SEC head coaches, but it'll be something that we're all going to try to have to learn how to how to use. Mike's obviously been in the NFL where they did it, and Dow's been in the NFL where he did it. And so we've got some guys that we can lean on, certainly from that standpoint. But uh, it'll, be, it'll be fascinating. Hopefully it'll be something that we'll be able to utilize some in spring practice and preseason camp to get used to. What can you share about last night's workout and what you guys had the team going through, and did you participate? I uh, participated in that. I was there. Uh, participating like I did at Fort Jackson where I was actually active in it. Um, other than running from station to station. And uh, I would say I was a 30% participant last night. Um, was there for all of it and, and active. But it was similar to something we did uh, two years ago, Hale. Um, I'm sure I don't want to steal Justin King's thunder and, and those guys or some of the stuff that they'll put out on social media. But just uh, what we call grit night around here kind of the culmination of the winter workouts, off-season conditioning before we break for spring break. We've always done something on that uh, Thursday night before spring practice or before spring break begins. Uh, year one, we did something over in the stadium. Year two, we went off campus. Year three, we utilized the, the area back here behind the facility before the um, that's out in the woods, essentially, and the stadium. And then this year we went off site again. So something really cool, just kind of trying to develop uh, more and more team chemistry and being able to um, execute in tough environments, which is what playing on the road in the SEC uh, entails. Coach, obviously your last couple coaching searches have been quick ones. Did you have a short list entering the offseason, and can you talk us through how these hires happen? 
Yeah, with Mike or with all of them in general? Uh, I guess starting with Mike and then Coach Elliott was hired pretty quickly as well. Yeah, I'd say somewhat of a short list. I think you you hear every athletic director talk about if they ever have a head coaching opening in, in a sport, that they have a short list, if you will. There's certainly guys in, in my mind or in my office that that – I have a lot of respect for as receiver coaches or tight ends coaches or running back coaches or defensive backs coaches um, that the first time I have an opening, I'm going to look at that list to see if any of those guys fit what we need at that time. Whenever you have an opening, you're immediately going to have a ton of coaches and a ton of agents that start calling your phone. And, you know, I was uh, February is a dead period, as you know, in college football. So recruiting wise, there's no one that can visit campus and then your players are off on the weekends. So at least the month of February allows coaches to have a little bit of a, I don't want to say breather because you're still working remotely, but I was, I was in the Bahamas last Saturday when the Coley news broke. So I was sitting on the beach and I've got, I feel like a hundred agents and coaches that are hitting me up and texting me and things like that, which wasn't the ideal scenario. Uh, as well, but that's part of it. But to answer your question, Mike was somebody that certainly I had thought of. Um, there were certainly some uh, power five wide receiver coaches, sitting power five wide receiver coaches that were interested in the position that reached out to me. But I think in all those situations, whether it be receivers or Sean Elliott or um, Joe D. Camillus, you may have a list, but it's at at each particular in each particular instance, who is the best fit for what you need at that moment? And I felt like in February of 2024, now March of 2024, that Mike Furry was the best fit for us from a wide receiver standpoint as well. And that's in you know when you talk to when you talk to Dal, uh, he's got to be on board with it because the quarterbacks offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach, offensive coordinator is going to work closely with the receiver coach and. And um, so they had to have a good working relationship. And Dow, just like I did, reached out to a lot of people that he knew that had worked with Mike and it was all positive and, and um, had some phone conversations with some people. But no one – I had a chance to get to know him a little bit last year. Uh, he brought his son to our football camp here in Columbia. And we spent some time talking in, in williams Bryce Stadium while his son was going through camp. And I just – and then some time in my office after camp. And as a head coach to another head coach, he was someone – I knew what he had done as a player and had some people that I knew that had worked with him at Marshall as well that spoke highly of him. Um, but I, m talking with him uh, person to person last year, I just remember walking away from that day in June thinking there's there's something different about this guy. And um, certainly was somebody that I felt uh, that felt like I'd want to have on our staff here in Columbia at some point. And then he came down here last week and we met with him and interviewed with him. And he was awesome and walked out of there. And Dal called me that night. He's like, what do you think? I'm like, I don't see the point in talking to anybody else. I mean, nobody's going to be better than what he just was. And then some of our players that knew him uh, from recruiting, uh, I'm still mad at him. He tried to recruit Mazio Bennett to come to Limestone to play. But as a competitor, that tells you, if y'all ask about recruiting, that tells you all you need to know about him as a recruiter is he told Mazio that the best person to develop him as a wide receiver was Hillman Limestone, which you, I respect that, and um, as well. So Mazio saw him in the building the other day, and and Mazio and some of the other receivers hit me up about, man, he's awesome. Got to know him in recruiting. Some of my buddies from college play at Limestone. They love him, and everything just kept kept coming back to Mike. Shane, obviously, this isn't limited just to you guys. This has happened. At other places with coaches leaving, sometimes you have three coaches in a span of two months, unfortunately. What has been the vibes? I know you talked about Mazio Bennett and some of the wide receivers, but what's been the message to those guys to get through this period of time and just being able to continue to stay focused? And any maybe receivers, I know it's a dead period, but from a recruiting standpoint, if any, you know, were to start to reach out over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, no, great question, Mike. Uh, certainly it's not ideal, but again, you know, like I told the team yesterday, if somebody – decides that this isn't the place they want to be, then great, you know, wish them well and, and let them move on. And that's what we did with the, you know, um, with James was he felt like he had a better situation for him and his family uh, in Athens. Um, had a daughter in high school who was more familiar with Athens, Georgia than she was Columbia, South Carolina, and was easier to move back from College Station and, and whatnot as well. So 
wish them well. And then, like I told our players, it's my job to now go try and find someone that is even better than the one that just left. No different than if someone at a college leaves to transfer somewhere else. You get the opportunity to hopefully replace them with a better player and fit in the locker room. And, and that's my job is not to sit around and worry about somebody that doesn't want to be here. Let's figure out who does want to be here. That was my message to um, the receivers that I met with because we had a week where we didn't have a receivers coach and or quite almost a week. Um, and just reaching out to those guys on FaceTime, text, phone call, uh, their parents last week just to assure them that, you know, nothing's changed, everything's good, that uh, their offer is still good, that I'm going to hire a, a fantastic receivers coach for them and can't wait for you to get to know them. That's what I told recruits. Same thing that I told our current players, current receivers, same thing, you know, that uh, it's my job as the head coach to get people here that can make you better and want to pour into you as human beings and make you a better player. And uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. And and um, I think those guys are excited about it. And, and I mean it, Mike. Like, it's, it's – I want people that, that want to be here. And if guys get opportunities to advance their career by going to be a head coach like Pete and Jody did, great. If a guy gets an opportunity that he thinks is better for his, his family, um, in this instance, I don't have to like it, don't have to agree with it. Um, was disappointing, but it's immediately who can I go hire now that wants to help us – bring a championship to Columbia, South Carolina. Because when I was hired in December 2020, that was my goal is to bring a championship to Columbia, South Carolina. And absolutely nothing has changed. And I want to do that for our players. I want to do that for our coaches. I want to do that for our amazing fans, uh, the greatest fans in America, because there's no reason why we can't. And if a guy doesn't want to be here and do that with us, then get the heck out of here. And let me go bring somebody in here that wants to fight his butt off and compete his butt off and go bring a championship to Columbia, South Carolina, because uh, we can and we are. And uh, that's my job, and that's what I'm working hard to do each and every day, and, and that's the goal with every single hire that we have. And that's my message to our players and recruits when we do have an opening. Uh, these are the kind of guys that I want to bring in, guys that can help us do that, guys that want to do that, and guys that want to be here and not just win a championship, but want to win a championship here at South Carolina. Hey Shane, <clears throat> obviously the uh, the carousel works both ways. But a week ago, when you were in the Bahamas, did you have any heads up that this might be coming? Do, does you know the head coach have to reach out to you for permission? Does um, the the guy have to say, "Hey, I'm interviewing"? Um, what is that process like? Uh, you don't have to. You know, I think Mike would know he's been in the NFL. I think in the NFL, teams have to put in, like, permission slips and permission requests and things like that. There's none of that. You know, the only request, permission request would be making sure that they know that there's a buyout, you know, that they're going to have to pay, whether it be for uh, the most recent change or, or anyone that, that, that left as well. But, no, it was um, – Certainly when I saw that Georgia had an opening for a receiver's position, I thought that, you know, they may reach out just because he had been there before and, and whatnot. Um, with that news break, Saturday morning, I think. Uh, Thursday had an inkling that it was a pretty good possibility that something might happen. Um, Kirby and I did talk. I think he was in Hawaii on a coach's trip. Um, so we were <laughs> both in tropical locations. I'm sure he didn't want to be trying to hire coaches because he had to hire, I think, what, four this offseason, five, something like that. So he's he'd been dealing with hiring coaches and was in Hawaii dealing with a five-hour time change, and, and it was difficult for him. But Kirby and I talked. Uh, Kirby texted me Friday. Um, we talked Saturday, I think, Kirby and I did. And um, and then James and I had a couple conversations on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it was, uh, um, you know, both at both sides tried to handle things the right way. I think. Chain uh, along those similar lines, do you think this was just a one-off situation for you guys that you were continuing to hire people into March, as you say, and or is this kind of tied to some of the new? The different things we've seen in college football, the portal, the, uh, you know, perhaps a new signing date up there where this kind of turnover is going to be more common than yeah. perhaps it's been in the past. In my mind, I think it's somewhat of a one-off. Um, 
you know, and again, the hires that we had to make was essentially it started before two guys that got head coaching positions. So this isn't like the season of off season turmoil in Columbia. We had two guys get head coaching jobs. I made a decision to move on from one and a guy made a decision that he felt was a better move for his family. I think in my mind, it starts with the, um, the NFL calendar of hiring coaches is a little bit later than the um, college calendar because those NFL coaches aren't getting hired until mid-January, a lot of them, late January, depending on if they're hiring Super Bowl coaches and things like that as well. So not to get too deep, and I'm not an NFL expert, but a lot of those NFL coaches, they can't hire other NFL coaches because they're under contract. So now they go to the college ranks because of, you know, coaches in college have always, a lot of them have always wanted to get to the NFL. We've got guys that have been in the NFL and want to be in college, whether it be Mike or Joe D as well. But there are college coaches that want to get to the NFL and the NFL hires coaches later than college does. So therefore Georgia had an opening for a wide receivers position because the Tampa Bay Bucks hired BMAC. And now Georgia's looking to hire coaches and they're interviewing people. And I think they interviewed a bunch of guys for the position and settled on the receiver coach that was here. Uh, but I just think it's, I think it's a lot of the calendar. I was on, knock on wood, pray this doesn't happen again, but last year we were on spring break and my wife and I were driving to the airport to go on a spring break trip last year. So this would have been the first week of March this week that's coming up. And I had an NFL team call me wanting to interview one of our coaches. And this was in March last year. And um, he didn't, and he stayed. But I think it's just kind of the calendar. I complain to NFL GMs all the time, can y'all like hire coaches quicker because it affects the college coaches as well. And it's not just me. Like I said, Kirby lost a coach to the NFL. And I know Florida lost two defensive coaches to the NFL after the 2022 season late as well. Um, I just think it's one of it. And you always got to be – you can't spend a – when timing becomes a little bit of uh, uh, more critical because now you're getting closer to spring practice. And the last thing that I wanted to be – wanted to do was hire a receivers coach. And then the whole team comes back and we get ready to start spring practice. And it's like, surprise, you know, here's the new receivers coach. I wanted to get somebody in here where he could get around the players yesterday, which he did, um, and uh, and whatnot. So you got to be ready. You got to be – have a plan going back to the question about a list or whatever it might be and and uh, be ready to move and act on on um, on who you want to hire. Coach. All right, well, excited for you guys to get to know our new wide receivers coach, Coach Mike Furry. Coach? I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, you guys coming here and, and taking your time out of your schedule to visit with us here today, uh, as well as Coach Beamer, all the, the kind words and, and through this process, everything that we've been through over the last 48, 72 hours. It's been a, it's been a pretty cool ride, to be honest with you. Um, but there's some, there's some folks that I need to thank real quickly before we get started. Uh, you know, what I've learned about USC over the last 48, 72 hours is the strength of this administration and, uh, and the strength of this program. And that starts with, uh, you know, Coach Tanner, uh, Chance Miller, uh, the Board of Trustees, everything that we've been through and what I've, how, what I've engaged in over the last uh, couple of days has been uh, very respectable and uh, it's been professional. Um, rather, it's the, just the situation in light of everything that's gone back at Limestone to uh, the announcement of the day, uh, just making sure everything was a smooth transition. So uh, I thank all of them and everybody involved in this, in this process. Uh, I would be in trouble if I didn't thank my wife. Uh, for you guys, we'll learn that uh, for about 21 years of our entire marriage, she has uh, followed around a football player in regards to moving, and uh, now she gets to do a coach in moving, and she's been doing that for 21 years, and my wife, Corin has been a, a uh, complete rock of our family and has been so supportive of every single move, and uh, I'm excited for her to become a big-time Gamecock fan here in South Carolina. We, uh, uh, Coach Beamer, thank you for this process. I know I have, uh, you know, he's, he's right, right? He's right. Uh, just last summer, uh, I had a chance to bring my son Stone down here to a, uh, junior, to a uh, high school camp. And uh, it was my first time here. It was my first time to experience 
uh, everything here at South Carolina, facilities, the resources, uh, the coaching staff, and as you guys know in general, uh, Coach Beamer and Dow Loggins. And I've known Dow for a long time. Uh, we never really crossed paths in, re in regards to uh, being in the same room together and, and, and working together. But we've had a bunch of relationships uh, through, and friendships through people that, uh, we, that we are both close with. Uh, that have always spoke so highly about uh, about him and and uh, how he works and what I've found what I've realized over the last 48 days or 48 hours or so is that they're right and uh, but I, I will tell you this um, there was a moment last summer while I was here uh, speaking with Coach Beamer and you know in this profession I've learned you know one of the values and in, in, in the one of the ways to be successful as a coach especially an assistant coach. Is to surround yourself with the good people, right? People that have that are high character, they're passionate, uh, they're on a mission to success. And I think one of the things that I felt connected with the most was uh, Coach Beamer's passion to make an impact in the youth and the kids that he's around. And that's something that I have strived on in my coaching career to basically put at the forefront to build programs because I believe in that. And, uh, and I was highly, highly, uh, uh, I, I just, from that moment when I left, I just, I had so much respect for him and became a Gamecock fan uh, and was hoping that, you know, obviously he would be successful and, and followed his, you know, followed the Gamecocks a little bit more than normal. But uh, I can tell you now that I am completely honored to be the wide receiver coach at, uh, at the University of South Carolina, and I'm honored to be part of the staff. And I told the team yesterday when I first walked in, and I'll never forget this, and some Jordans and jeans and, and a polo and, and a vest. Uh, and I got a chance to just talk to the guys in the special teams room that uh, I'm here to help. I'm here to assist. I'm here to develop. I'm here to push. And uh, I don't see why USC doesn't have the best wide receiver core in the country year in and year out. Uh, we recruit the best players in the country year in and year out. And uh, that should be our standard, and that will be our standard. And uh, that's something that we're going to have to get to work on because development is not, it's not easy. It's not a coach's choice. Development has to be a player's choice first. And uh, as we get to know these guys and <clears throat> their, their, my relationship with them and learn about their backgrounds, learn about where they're from, and learn about their stories, right, and get to know them, uh, we'll start developing these young men. And, and, uh, but until then, uh, I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to be the wide receiver coach here at South Carolina. Any questions? How you doing, Mike? David Kloniger with the Charleston Post and Courier. Welcome to Columbia. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, a couple for you. One, will you cross-train your receivers to also play safety, just in case? Uh, there will be a borderline. I, I do think there's a lot of tangibles. If, if a young man wants to get to the next level, they do have to learn some of those defensive qualities to play special teams. And so I do think that those are things that you do talk about, your tackling and things like that. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to just coaching wideouts, you know, just teaching them how to become great wide receivers first uh, before we talk about becoming a, 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 uh, a play both ways. And two, uh, with recruiting, I mean, obviously you've done it as a head coach at Limestone. So is it really that much of a switch for you to come into this position and, you know, I guess, focus more on the position instead of recruiting the whole team? Yeah, you know, it becomes uh, a lot easier, right, in regards to now my focal point is to make sure that my room is, uh, is, is the standard that we set. Um, I do think when you're an assistant coach just coming from that chair before, I do think that that is a major response. That's, that's the number one responsibility of any assistant coach is to make sure that your room is uh, significant enough to be a highly competitive room uh, to have a lot of talent in that room. And listen, I mean, we're all put on this earth to be, to do something. And it's not to just, I tell our guys all the time, it's not to just be average, right? I mean, we're put on this world to, to go do something if you believe in that, and, and that's to be great. And uh, I do believe that the Blitnikoffs and the Heisman Trophy winners and all those kind of things and the candidates uh, should come out of that room, right? That should be your standard. Uh, but it will make it a lot easier uh, just focusing on 13, 14 guys instead of, uh, the, the, the joy that I've had over the last uh, two years of 205 guys. So it'll, be, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll shorten down that time just a little bit.
Hey, Coach, I'm Hale McGranahan with the Big Spur 24-7. Um, I, I was just curious with, with what Coach Beamer was saying about Mazia. What what do you recall about getting to know him, I guess, in their uh, recruiting you, process? <laughs> you can call Mazia's dad, and he'll tell you about that one. But, uh, you know, I, I believe I believe that uh, – I believe there's two type of two type of athletes. Okay, I believe that there are athletes who uh, want to just enjoy the ride, right? And, and they want to say they went somewhere and they want to use it as a as leverage for the rest of their lives. And it's great. That's a great avenue, right? That, that's that's awesome. There's a lot. I mean, that's that's a lot of kids that have to take that avenue. And then there are kids that want to get to the next level. They they, they truly want to get to the National Football League. And I believe that there's one thing that not only allows you the opportunity to get to the National Football League, but the National Football League, what you really need to know is how to stay. And I think that all comes through development while they're in college and before they get there. I think there's a lot of development in talking about OTAs. I think there's a lot of development talking about the mindset of, of uh, mini camps, of off-season workouts, of – what it's like to be in a meeting room when everybody else is trying to take your job. Like, there's a lot of th stuff to me that has to go involved, you know, be involved in that and development. And listen, I've been fortunate. I've been very blessed. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of gold jackets uh, practice. I've seen a lot of gold jackets uh, take notes and, and do walkthroughs. And I've seen their personality and I've seen their mindset, right? And I think that's, that's part of uh, what I think is one of the biggest traits that you have to do is you have to be able to develop people uh, to get to that point. And, you know, I feel pretty comfortable that I have enough uh, knowledge and wisdom that I've been fortunate enough to have to develop young men to get to that point. Now, am I going to take you to the National Football League? No, that's between you and a man upstairs, to be honest with you. But if you want to be developed, uh, you want to learn how to catch, you want to learn how to get off the line of scrimmage, you want to learn how to uh, develop your stems, your transition in and outs. If you want to learn about how to run to the catch point, uh, why you do this, why you study, why you I mean, that's you, you got to be taught that stuff. And uh, and I feel comfortable doing that. So, yeah, if you're a high talented athlete, I think you have a chance to get to the National Football League. Absolutely. I'll try to recruit you because I feel confident enough that I can I can I can advocate those skill sets uh, to give you a chance. And I think that's uh, I think that starts by building that relationship and respect and trust immediately. Uh, because of what I've been able to do and how I can remove that and make it about the player. And uh, so, yes, that was a great conversation with Mazio's dad and the Mazio f and Mazio's family and everybody, a lot of other kids, too, uh, in this state. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be around here a long time, which is a, uh, which is a testimony yes, uh, over the last 24 hours with all the high school coaches that have reached out and said congrats or they're excited because they know what we've done and they know the relationships that we built. And uh, that's a, uh, it, it's been, it's been pretty sweet. Hey Mike, Mike, you have a Gamecock Central. Uh, since yesterday's announcement, there's been a lot of players, parents that have reached out and we've heard from some of them. And the first thing they mentioned about you is just energy. What can yeah. fans, what can players expect a Mike Furry wide receiver room to look like? Well, I think it's uh, – there's three things uh, that I've, I've built myself, and I think there's – it's what's called a method. And uh, I've carried this with me my whole entire life. And the first thing of that method – how to, to me, if you can create the method, that creates success, right? And I think the first thing that you, it's guaranteed is effort. Uh, I think when you go out there and you watch us run around, uh, it, it's not going to be shy of effort. It's not going to be shy of, of exhausting ourselves for a better purpose, and that's our team. And we'll practice like that. We'll, put, we'll play like that. We'll run routes like that. Uh, there will always be a purpose. Uh, but it's going to be a maximum effort that's going to be behind that. And that's in everything that we do. Uh, again, going back to the question about development, you know, some of the greatest ones I've ever been around, they give max, max effort and walkthroughs, right? Now, I, I know the tone of things, and I know how you slow stuff down, and I know how to go crazy on things. But when you have maximum effort, when you give effort, that means it's important. Right. That you're telling somebody it's important to you. And so you're trying to make sure that you can maximize that. And so I talk to, I'll, I'll talk to our guys all the time about giving 110 percent. Right. More than the normal. Become rare. Right. And then uh, goal oriented. OK. Uh, and, and I call that level up. We'll talk about leveling up every day. I talk to our guys about just making sure that uh, we have goals that we want to reach. Goals for now. Goals for the team. Individual goals. And how do we get there? And to me, 
when you become goal-oriented, well, then that's going to make sure you're locked in on your goal, which to me now becomes your discipline. Your discipline in your route running, your discipline in your studies, your discipline in your academics, your discipline uh, anytime that we, whatever it is, anytime that we take the field. And, again, I think through all those things, what evolves then is a great teammate. And I think when you become a great teammate, then you become a great group. And when you become a great group, now you become pretty lethal. And, uh, and I think all those things hit really well. They're very self-explanatory. Uh, they're easy to manage every single day. But uh, I, I just don't think you live any different. And I think if you do live any different, then I think you're wasting what the good Lord's blessed you with. And if, you, if you're going to waste that, then I'm going to get after you. And, uh, and like Coach Beamer said, just like coaching, you know, if that's not for you and this isn't for you and if this is not how you want to live and this is not how you want to pursue uh, the best that you can become for your team, well, this might not be the best place, right? But that's how you got to find out. Rather than putting hope out on the field, you're going to put a product. And uh, that product's going to be daggone stinking good and they're going to freaking run, you know, run around like a bunch of banshees and play ball. And a second one for you. I know it's different in the sense that you're not going from head coach to head coach, but we've seen a lot of Division II coaches in the past shoot two decades, whether it be Brian Kelly, Kurt Signetti. They've had success and they've credited what they've learned from the Division II level. What do you think being able, and I know you had two stints at Limestone, but what do you think being able to work from the Division II level can help you at this level? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I, I think there's really two, two things that I've learned that I'm really excited about. Uh, one coming from D2 and then one coming from being a head coach. Being in, having an experience as a head coach, to me, allows you to become a great assistant because you, you learn, you, you just kind of have an idea of what you want your assistants to do, right? Take, a, take some burden off you, do your job, right? Keep your, office, you know, keep your office clean, look good, be presentable, get your players ready, get them to study, you know, all those good things. And I think those are things that I'm excited about that I get to do knowing – what his expectations are because of that chair. And then when you talk about coming from D2, uh, you're talking about a 205-man roster that you had to manage. Uh, you're talking about my, – my wife actually said this the other day. She's actually excited for me – not to take a break, right? Not to take a break, but to be able to focus on one job with 13, 14 players, not 30 jobs with 205. And, and I think – the value of going through all those 30 jobs has taught me the academic side, the financial aid side, uh, the scholar, how, you know, how important the scholarship side is, uh, the dormitories, the meal plans, the, all that good stuff. And so I think there's a lot of knowledge in there that I think helps more towards the recruiting part, uh, understanding that, and, and obviously, obviously building the roster. But at the same time, uh, there, there's a lot of things that I'll take with me that, that, uh, that, that's grateful that I'll be able to present to our players and, 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 you know, continue to make them the best that we possibly can. Hey, Mike, Pete Iacobelli from the AP here in uh, South Carolina. Uh, welcome Appreciate to it. the school. Um, I don't think there's anybody else in this room who's ever led the NFC in catches. What was that experience like for you? You talk about seeing gold yeah. jackets, guys like Barry Sanders, the year after you got there, you know, they drafted Megatron, I think. Yeah. Uh, what was that Catch experience 98 like? 98 balls, and he, they get rid of me from Megatron <laughs> to this day. <laughs> what was that like, and, and, and how did you – it seems like you've cherished those memories yeah. and everything and how they helped you to get to this point now. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, humbling is the word, to be honest with you. Uh, it's humbling because uh, at that time – a lot of people don't really know this, but Mike March brought me to Detroit to teach four first, five first-round guys the playbook, his system, how to practice, how to play in games, and uh, how to help. And uh, that was my job. So it's funny because I was still trying to play ball, but Mike was bringing me over as, you know, to help out those guys. Uh, two, day, uh, two weeks into the season, all of a sudden you're starting – and, uh, you know, you play 15 games and you catch 98 balls and 1,100 yards and, and all those things, uh, it was humbling. And uh, to, me it, 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 to me, it does prove that all things are possible through work ethic. Uh, they're still out of your control, but, but, but work ethic can allow you to accomplish things that you probably never could dream of. And I tell you what, I, I use the word humble because all those lessons that I feel that I've been through is not to get a yellow jacket. 
right? I wasn't going to have a yellow. I didn't want a yellow jacket. You know, what I wanted to do was just maximize my potential and then look for my calling. And at that time, when I caught 98 balls, a lot of people don't know this, but I actually uh, had started training a bunch of high school and college kids back in Columbus, Ohio, Ohio for my father-in-law's football team. Uh, and I was enjoying that a lot more than I was playing football. And all of a sudden, I caught 98 balls and 1,100 yards. And, you know, you just, you, you just got to figure out why. And a lot of it's to be able to handle success, uh, to be handled, you know, to be able to handle those things are all teaching lessons that I will be able to use for my coaching career, uh, not as a bragging point, right? Uh, I don't, I couldn't tell you the last time I told somebody that I had 98 catches in one season in the National Football League. Uh, I can tell you that I've been asked that a lot of times, uh, and I think it's important for me to refer it to how that happened and how, you, how that can happen to them. And uh, here's how we get to work in this part of the method. And that's what uh, that, I think that's that, that's the course that I was blessed with uh, through all those the friendships, the gold jacket friendships, you know, like you mentioned uh, from CJ to, uh, you know, uh, being there when they named Megatron. I mean, I was there. Right. I was on, I, was <laughs> I was taking a knee with Roy Williams and Roy Williams said, I'm Optimus Prime. and We're going to name you uh, uh, Megatron, you know, and, and, and I think Roy was doing it so they everybody would know him as Optimus Prime. <laughs> he didn't realize he just created Megatron. And uh, but, you know, Isaac Bruce, Tory Holt, uh, Marvin Harrison, guys that have uh, Terry Glenn all the way back to college. Um, uh, this, all the guys that have literally just taken me under their wing again to me, not to have a yellow jacket. But to be honest with you, uh, for me to be able to walk into the University of South Carolina and have a uh, report or a uh, or, or the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to take what I've learned and give it to them. To not say that I know Isaac Bruce or Tory Holt, but to say, hey, let's make your career and let's develop your career and let, let, let's get you to that point. And if that's what you want, right? And uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate with that. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to spend that knowing that that's what you're supposed to do uh, when you're in that role. And, and, uh, and I'm excited to use that here. Hey, Coach Jordan Kay with the State Newspaper here in Columbia. Welcome. Um, Appreciate it. A, a lot of like former players, and you've talked about development so much. I, I think a lot of a big part of that is just making the game of football more simple yeah. for guys who are coming in yep. to college. How do you and, do and that? Pros, right? yeah. yeah. How do you do that, and and how do you do that successfully? Yeah, I think it's all presentation. I think it's all about presentation. I think uh, I think you can you, you can give too much information. Instead of just the simplicity of what you want to get done, uh, you could sit here all day and talk about uh, the little things that you need to fix when really there's, there's only a couple big things you need to master, right? And, uh, and so, um, but I, I think it's all, I literally think the entire thing is about presentation. Uh, it's getting to know your players about how they learn. Uh, it's getting to know if they're a board guy or if they're a grass guy. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it goes all the way back to just learning about where they're coming from, right? Their, their, their household, their, the way they were raised, the, the, uh, everything about them has everything uh, to me of, of uh, how they learn and uh, you know, how you can get them to open up, uh, how you can get them to recall, right? And uh, we'll start that when we come back from spring break, but, but I think that's the, the entire thing is presentation. And it's not just being – a dictator of this is what we want and get it done and that's it if not you're out well you'll never develop the young man right you'll never develop him if you don't give him a chance uh or if you if you don't maximize the way to teach him in different ways whatever those are you have to find those out and uh and, and we'll start doing that here um after i'm gonna go catch some sleep after i came here and they took me some grit night last night to 12 o'clock with same clothes on that i had <laughs> on the field, but uh, I'm excited for that. And, and I, I'll tell you this, uh, a lot of coaches aren't allowed to do that. And a lot of it's because the, the head coach just mandates that you just get it done. And, and, uh, and I think that was one of the things that's very appealing to Coach Beamer, as I mentioned earlier, about his dedication and passion to make that impact. It, that, that, that goes along with it. You know, you got to be able to have the freedom to build those relationships, you got to be able to have the freedom to have the time, right, to develop, and the awareness that you got to develop, 
And again, like I said, that that's college and pros, because uh, it's such a it's such a now world that we live in. That uh, you know, so it's it, I'm fortunate enough to do that, and we'll start when we get back. Thank you. Hey, Mike, Phil Cornbloop, Sports Talk Media Network. How you doing? So you coached at Kentucky Christian in Limestone with limited resources, limited revenues, and now you're stepping into this place. You're stepping into the SEC. Your thoughts on what is now at your fingertips to be able to use, and, and then secondly, I know at Limestone, I think you used to like work out with your players in the yeah. weight room and kind of show them that you can hang <laughs> with them. Will you do the You've same thing here in the people. weight room? Uh, first of all, um, going back to your first question, the the uh, the the it, it's hard to explain. Uh, about your relationships with kids, right? And and I think, uh, first of all, in regards to resources, I think that when you dig into a young man and you truly, truly, truly get that under that young man to understand that you care about his success, I think that's where the resources go away. And I think I truly believe that when you have that relationship with those young men, the only thing that matters is what's inside that four inch line and what you need to do to prepare to get in it. And uh, now, is it nice? Yes. Is it nice to have the team room? Yes. You know, is it nice to have a facility, a uh, locker room, um, everything that, that, that USC uh, provides here? Absolutely. It's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's the best in the country, right? But sometimes having the best in the country in regards to just items doesn't allow you to maximize your potential because what to me matters is what's inside, what's inside of you, not what's inside of your facility. And uh, so there's a lot of things that we have to use to get to that point. Uh, but when you talk about recovery, when you talk about the nutrition, when you talk about the things that will allow a kid to uh, be able to respond faster after practices and things like that, yeah, that's, that's, that's you know, you, you don't get that at those levels. Uh, I think it's important to work out with the guys. Now, you're not going to see me out there with cleats. Uh, you're not going to see me out there doing anything just to draw attention to what I've done. Uh, but I do think it's – uh, I always say all the time, and I was just telling Coach Elliot, Elliot this morning, uh, we were talking because I think Coach Elliot and I hit it off really. I think we're kind of from the same mold a little bit. Now, he's, he got a little bit more anger in there a little bit than I do. Uh, I think I've learned to control mine just a little bit. But we, we were talking about that uh, uh, just a little bit ago. But w when I was talking to Coach Elliot, you know, it's hard to ask your players to do something that you haven't done. And I'm really, really big on that. Rather, it's uh, like last night we went to Grit, you know, running with the guys from station to station, right? It, you're creating a relationship where you're not making yourself bigger than the team. You're not making yourself bigger than the player. Just because you're, just cause you're the, uh, the coach uh, and now, or I'm the coach and you're the player doesn't mean that my role is bigger than yours. My role is just to help you. Like we all need to be on the same page, right? And, uh, but I do think that there's some camaraderie that can be made uh, between the two of you when uh, you are doing something with them. And I think it creates dialogue. I think it creates, uh, again, just a, a stronger relationship and, and, uh, and respect. And uh, so as long as I'm allowed to do that per the NCAA and Coach Beamer, uh, I'll do that as much as I can to stay involved in our kids, uh, to continue to show them that I am here for them and that I'm not going to ask them to do something that I haven't done or that I wouldn't do. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.